In the late 1990s, the internet was gaining popularity at a rapid rate, and tech enthusiasts were starting to download video game content straight off this new communications platform. In the early days, these pieces of downloadable content, or DLC, were primarily things like fan-made extensions to popular video games and Doom mods. Lots and lots of Doom mods. It was mostly harmless fun amongst a small group of technically proficient gamers and developers. This would change with the introduction of online gaming platforms like MMOs and Microsoft's Xbox Live, which allowed players to make purchases directly over the internet. For the first few years, this was mostly game companies selling subscriptions to play in their virtual worlds or selling small expansion packs online, which wouldn't justify a new game release in their own right. The pushback was minimal, and most players were actually excited to be able to pay four or five dollars to get an extra few hours worth of gameplay without having to go to GameStop to buy an entirely new game. This was until 2006, when Bethesda, the developer of the Elder Scrolls series, released DLC which added nothing to the game other than armor for your in-game horse. This $2.50 optional download in a single player game was the first time that players actively pushed back at the idea of paying money for pixels that otherwise added nothing to the game. Despite the negativity, the horse armor became the ninth best selling DLC for the Elder Scrolls game, beating out entire expansion packs which took thousands of hours in development time to produce. By contrast, the horse armor was just a 3D model which took a 3D artist an afternoon to put together. Other gaming studios saw this success, and 18 years later, most of the money made by the $180 billion gaming industry comes from sales made after the customer has already purchased the game. This might seem harmless to most of you watching. You might even think it's a good way to subsidize the cost of development, making video games cheaper for people who are not interested in these in-game purchases. But these seemingly harmless pixels are being knowingly exploited to prey on some of the most vulnerable people in our society. To find out why, it's time to learn how money works, which was made possible today by Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a daily email newsletter which keeps you up to date with what's going on in the world of business, tech, finance, crypto, and culture all in a simple, easy to digest format. Each daily newsletter features short segments which will take you no more than a minute to read but will still get you up to speed with what's going on in the world, all while providing handy short links if you do want to read further. Morning Brew mixes in some heavy hitting stories about major world events with other more niche stories like this one about an NFT collector who lost over $2 million in board apes after falling for a run of the mill phishing scam. This story was actually very useful to me as I was writing this video, you'll find out why shortly. Morning Brew is the best way to start a productive day, and the best part of it is it's completely free. So there's absolutely no risk in finding out how much better informed you can be when you pair your morning coffee with a scroll of Morning Brew. Check out the link below to easily sign up. Video game developers are companies with a profit motive, and in many instances, shareholders who they need to keep happy. Selling a game once is great, but it means there is a set amount of money that can be made from a set amount of games. Exceptions do exist, somehow I have managed to buy Skyrim for the PS3, PS4, and PC, but I don't like to talk about it. The problem here is that some people are only willing to spend $20 a month on video games where other people are happy to spend thousands. You could try to charge thousands of dollars for your game, but unfortunately not many people would be willing to pay that price. The only way to truly maximize profit is to get every possible gamer to pay the maximum possible amount that they are individually willing to pay for the game. That's impossible to achieve with a direct sale. A GameStop employee can't be expected to look over someone's financial records before setting an asking price for a copy of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, so you need to be smarter. What you need to do is offer a game that gets slightly better the more you pay for it. If you want to get really crafty, you can make the game itself free to download and play, but lock big advantages behind in-game transactions. Your free version of Clash of Clans is probably a perfectly fine game, but you will be destroyed by another dude that drops $2,000 a month upgrading his base. It might be annoying for you, but it's great for the game company. Most people only play their game because it's free. Some might throw in a few bucks to pay for a premium subscription, and then there are a few hundred so-called whales that drop a thousand dollars a month to make sure they are the most powerful players possible. This game extracted the maximum possible amount of money out of everybody that plays it. 
the game developers aren't even worried about all the players who aren't even paying them a cent. They might cost them a small marginal amount for server hosting, but they are offering back something far more valuable. They are the entertainment for the whales who are paying thousands of dollars a month. Someone isn't going to keep paying more money to upgrade their weapons if they can't use them to absolutely dominate some poor kid who thought they would just try out a free mobile game. Business students call this price skimming, where businesses will alter their prices for the same product for different people in order to maximize profits. Gamers call this pay to win. Monetization in games takes on a few different forms. The best type of game in the gamer's eye is a game that is free with no outlets for monetization at all. The problem is, of course, that this doesn't generate any revenue for whoever put the time and effort into developing the game. That doesn't mean that these games don't exist though, and I salute the dedicated souls behind them. The next step down from there are games that are free to play that sell game items that make cosmetic changes only. A new hat for your character, or a dapper new outfit. It doesn't improve your stats in the game, but it's cool to look at and some people are happy to pay some money for the outfits which keeps the game financed. Pretty good trade if you ask me. One worse than that is games that you need to pay for up front, but also offer cosmetic items. Again, these items don't give you any special advantage over other players in the game, but if you've already paid $60 for a video game, you might not like having more shit marketed to you in the game itself. Worse again are free games that have in-game advantages for sale. Mobile games are notorious for this. You can download Rise of Warship Legends for free, but if you want to be competitive against other players, you are almost forced into paying money to skip arbitrary timers and unlock powerful items. The absolute worst are games that you need to pay for, but still offer in-game advantages for money. When EA released Star Wars Battlefront, they were met with, um, moderate resistance for locking characters like Darth Vader behind real cash paywalls or obscenely difficult in-game challenges. But what's the actual harm here? It might make some games a little bit less fun, but it's not like anybody is forcing you to play them. Well, the harm comes to the people that unfortunately already do. A 2018 report by Daniel King of the Society for the Study of Addiction has reported that video game addiction is very real, and that addiction is being preyed upon by game companies to extract a lot of money out of a surprisingly small group of people. Wheels is a term typically used by casinos to describe patrons that gamble significant amounts of money. The casinos will cater to these high rollers in any way that they can so they keep coming back and losing more money at the tables. Whales and video games are just the same, and video game companies cater to them in the same way. You want to feel like an absolute badass? Drop $200 on in-game gems that will let you crush any opponent, except for maybe the guy that spent $500 on gems. The report explains that this rewards your brain by tricking it into believing that purchasing in-game items is just part of skillful gameplay. This becomes all the more sinister when the game companies spend years refining their systems to maximize this effect on your brain. Perhaps nowhere is this clearer to see than in the loot box. For those of you who don't know, a loot box is a collective term given to in-game purchases that offer out random items. This means that a player could spend money on an in-game purchase and not get the item that they really wanted. They may not get any item of value at all. Loot boxes add this element of chance into this toxic cocktail of predatory monetization, which can lock even the most pragmatic players into a loop of trying just one more spin to try and get that super rare character. The next tool that these companies will use to their advantage is the player base themselves. Online games are meant to be social. For many serious gamers, they spend more time with their online friends than they do interacting with the people in the real world, especially during the pandemic. There are three types of people that gamers will meet in these games. Players that are better than them because they spend a lot of money, players that are worse than them but will offer an ego boost to the gamer who did spend a lot of money, and peers who have been conditioned by the game to not think too critically about dropping a few hundred bucks for a slight in-game advantage. Humans are both social and competitive beings. Gamers are on average more isolated than non-gamers, so when they get the chance to spend a little cash to flex in the social setting that they spend the most time in, most of them will take it. All of these people, without even realizing it, will be pushing each other to spend more money in-game, which is a big reason why some of the most profitable games in the world are free. The final tool is big data. Since most of these games are played online, the developers have one final advantage in the battle to extract cash from their customers' pockets. 
it's impossible for a gamer to know more about the game than the game company knows about them. Anybody who has played these types of games will be able to attest to the very confusing currency systems in the game. Some games will have multiple different currencies to collect, gems, coins, pearls, and they will all be used to unlock different things in the game. A coin might be used to pay for armor, but you will need pearls to unlock special spells and cosmetic outfits can only be paid for with gems. Many people have compared this to casinos giving players poker chips instead of letting them play with actual money, because people don't experience the same emotional response handing over a $100 poker chip as they would with a $100 bill. This is no doubt part of the strategy, but I think in-game tokens are worse, because while poker chips have a clear face value, these games make it really hard to work out how much value you are actually getting out of an in-game purchase, because it introduces an exchange rate. The last thing you want to be doing while enjoying a game is exchange rate math. Because of this, game companies can present tailored offers to gamers to maximize the chances that they go and pull out their credit card. Activision and EA both have patents on their microtransaction systems, and they keep them so closely guarded because they are the primary revenue generator for these two ginormous public companies. These companies want to form habits. A player who spends $100 every week is worth far more than a player who spends $1,000 just once. This also slowly allows players to fall into the biggest trap of all time, the sunk cost. A game company is likely to make a very modest offer with a big reward first. If the gamer decides to purchase that offer, all subsequent offers will become gradually more expensive with declining true in-game value. Remember, this is made intentionally hard to keep track of because of the different in-game currencies the developers use. By the time the gamer realizes what has happened, they might have spent thousands of dollars on a video game that they thought they would be playing for free. At that point, there is no point in putting the game down because they have already sunk so much time and effort into playing this game that it would be silly to stop now. A lot of these video game whales are not wealthy either. On the contrary, the report found that a lot of these purchases were paid for with debt that the gamer had no way of paying back. So what are you to do when you have mounting debt and a partner that is angry at you for spending your grocery money on a virtual battleship? You look for an escape, of course, and what better escape exists than an online universe filled with your enthusiastic friends who all think that you're a hero because you unlocked the Ultra Mega Sword, which you could upgrade right now to the Giga Ultra Mega Sword for just $29.99. Preying on habitual addictive behavior from socially isolated people who just want a platform to socialize on is extremely unethical. Every bit as unethical as a casino without even offering the chance for these players to make any of their money back. Now, if you want to learn about more ways that companies are intentionally hijacking internet culture for their own profit, go and watch my video on the companies intentionally fueling the meme bubble to profit off people investing into securities like GameStop, AMC, and cryptocurrencies. Since this video was obviously not sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, I want to say another thank you to Morning Brew, my patrons and channel members, for making it possible for everybody to keep on learning how money works.